we start 2018 with a grind and a bang. We're on board with Rotting Reds in our latest instalment of A Year in the Life of Red Deer. Think once, think twice, think beta. Should Blaze Orange be the sensible option for the British beating line? You can't get anything sensible out of you lot, can you? We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to the first Field Sports Britain of 2018. It's mid-October and we've been summoned back to Ardnamurchan in the Scottish Highlands. The red deer rut is on, ish. The wet weather is delivering a soft rut, fragmented and prolonged. When you think about it, these sort of titans that you're seeing racing around the hills at the moment, it's quite incredible that when you look down at your feet, the vegetation that we're standing on is what these creatures are growing out of. And all that mass and muscle and power is, is really at the end of the day it's a herbivore, it's a grazer and uh, it's, it's quite remarkable that these mountain landscapes produce these beautiful creatures. A forecast dry spell could mean there's one last flurry and an opportunity to get a personal perspective for the latest chapter in A Year in the Life of Red Deer. If you like big and bold, then the Red Deer Rut is the most impressive wildlife spectacle in the British Isles. It attracts wildlife tourists and hunters from all over the world. Uh, it's so exciting to watch, just, uh, just watch another stag come on the scene and then to see the stag react to it and to look after his, uh, his hinds, absolutely awesome. When we were out in September we could see the stags were fit, prime, ready to go and we're now joining them at the tail end of the rut. So what, what's happened now is most of the mating's gone on because they, they rotate in uh, the way that they, they come into season. They don't just come into season once. They're, the hinds do this thing as we call what called polyoustra, so they will come repeatedly into season in cycles. And we're now got a, a situation, in the last two to three days, there's been a flurry of rutting activity again. And that's what you're, you're hearing, hearing and seeing at the moment. You can see this big royal, he's actually a 13 pointer stood at our back. And a few minutes ago, him and a 10-pointer were what we call parallel walking. And what they do, it's part of the threat process where larger stags, or alpha males, are trying to size one another up. And very often challenges end where this one stag is intimidated by the other, backs off and, and decides to leave it for another day. But in that whole parallel walking process, what they're doing is assessing one another for size. And when they're equally matched, frequently what they'll do is that will lead to uh, combat the two stags will go head to head and fight and, it, and it, it's uh, though they do inflict quite a degree of injury on one another and we will see eyes taken out holes in shoulders and backs and and, and tears and, and flanks most of these uh, contacts end with with more or less of a pushing shoving contest and the bigger animal of the two will, will win but there's a little bit of sense in it as well some of the older flyer stags will take the advantage of the high ground and the advantage of uh, gravity over the younger stag and push him away out the road. So very classic bit of red deer behaviour and a fantastic thing to watch. It's all very well seeing these animals roar and strut from afar, but is there any more to be learned from being that little bit closer to the action? Well, we've been working on the practicalities of fixing a camera to the head of a wild stag and releasing him back into the herd to capture some interaction. The on-off nature of the rut has made it difficult to predict when would be the best time, but if it's going to happen at all, it's today. Look at this. He's going to thrash the antlers on something. 
he knows it's there. He knows it's there. You can see that you can see him kind of he knows there's something on his head. I think you'll find you'll get him working bracken with it quite quickly, you know. I'm just quite delighted with it. I'm now like you desperately keen to see what we actually get in the next five hours. I'm quite relieved with that because I've not eaten dash for three. Oh, he's off for a good look he's round. Deer, yeah, he's off for a good look round. Yeah. There'll be a big stag with hinds just around that corner. So much can go wrong. Did anyone actually press record? We'll know the results in 24 hours when we return to this 2,000 acres of Scottish hillside. In the meantime, there's hunting to be done. Neil still has stags and therefore still has clients. Al Kamatov is a Bulgarian businessman who lives in the UK. This mad keen hunter has hunting interests back home, but Scotland has a special place in his heart. I've been able to connect with the people here and of course, watching deer roaring up in the hills, what can be more, more beautiful than that? It's the closest way you can be to the nature, to the top form of the nature, or for this habitat. And once you live there, you want to live it again and again. Neil is, as always, selective about which stags he's prepared to remove from the herd. It takes most of the afternoon, but finally, he spots an animal that is perfect for Al and the management plan. Another trick of the trade, when you're out stalking at the rut, pay close detail to what is around the guy that's holding the hinds. Because only if the stag holding the, holding the hinds is really old or is something that switched tops would you give any thought to taking him. Other than that, concentrate on the deer that nature hasn't decided to put in pole position. What we're going to do now, that hinds are starting to draw into the bottom of the glen and there's quite a good young 10-pointer with them. We don't really want him. But if we try and come up the side of the glen, the chances are we'll push them into the stag that we want to shoot. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up around the back of this ridge, much similar to what we've done in the past, yep. and get between the 10-pointer the and the stag we're looking for and take him. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So we'll give it our best. Well, yep. we've got two or three hours to do this yep. in, so yep. we'll take our time yep. and we'll head off. All right. Considering that the deer, in Neil's words, haven't had a dry back in months, the weather is being kind to us. Deer start moving up off the edge of the trees here as well. I've always stag here and below us here. So we need to keep round to them and try to get above this guy. He works the flat top of the hill like a chess grandmaster. Each move could have a dozen consequences. Can we afford to bump and lose that stag? Will the sheep give us away? What if the wind were to change? Okay. Where that little flat piece in the ridges. When we get to there and look down. He should be about 160 yards below us. We have a big stack off on our right and that dead point on our left. So when we draw to the top, we're going to have deer on both sides of us. But if the wind stays steady in this gully, it should work. Okay. Eventually, we arrive right above our chosen beast. I'm going to stick one in your hand. How's that looking for you? Let him come outside if you want. You're on him? Yep. On you go. Good shot. Good shot. He's hard hit. Yeah. Yep. And that's the boy we've been driving about for hours looking for. Yes. It's been an enjoyable late evening stalk and Al and Neil have the result they were after. When we were last talking about stags a, a few weeks ago, we were looking at characteristics and uh, what I always suggest to people, there, there are different characteristics that appear in stags that are from a welfare to other stags and from a genetic quality point of view, you don't want to see. And classically, sort of the number one enemy of anyone managing deer on the hill, or in woodland for that matter, if they're doing it for, for best practice, is that things with sabre tops as you can see here, you want rid of these guys. Now some stags in their life will never ever have anything other than a sabre top. Whereas this guy here, this is classically what you would call going back. So a few weeks ago we were talking about a rectangle or a triangle. And if we look at this guy, the triangle we described, 
he fits in it perfectly. You've got a long brow point, bay point gone, short tray point, and top disappeared. Other things that give away his condition, if we look along his back here, we can see he's quite thin. We could see that quite clearly with the, with the Leica scope from the road, and there's unlikely in a wet winter like we seem to be heading into that he would have done well. It's a mission accomplished, you yeah. know. It's like, this, this is the stag you want to harvest. Yeah. I, I would not want to harvest from the top of a hill anything which is magnificently beautiful at his prime and age. Maybe we'll do a few more together. And uh, with a great pleasure, and for us, the guys who are coming, it's the main thing. We want one day hunt here with our kids, and eventually maybe with the grandkids. And we always have wants to see this silence as beautiful as they are today. Yeah. Hopefully Thank I'll you very much. I'll still be fit enough for the grandkids, but I'll try my best <laughs> for the kids anyway. Hopefully I'll still be good. I sure, I sure you could make it. <laughs> Our Bulgarian friend is clearly passionate about hunting. And as a lecturer in economics, he's perfectly placed to see the cold, hard business reality of it too. I get worried because I believe that if we lose for the moment feeling and understanding of importance of this fantastic animal for this landscape, we're going to lose it all. Right there like that while I shut the tailgate. With one deer heading for the chiller, we all start wondering if, on the other side of the estate, there's another deer still attached to a camera. Absolutely without a shadow of a doubt, you're right, the camera's not there. The plate that the camera was on is there, but the camera's not on it. With no GPS and 2,000 acres to play with, this could be game over. Neil uses his deer sense to check the area. There's fresh fraying, fresh tracks between cover, and after 10 nervous minutes, Mr. Rowentree finds the proverbial camo tape covered needle in a haystack. Whose idea was the camo tape? So what did our stag get up to? What was really interesting for us is we took a stag fr from the herd, attached the camera to him without any impact on his welfare at all, and returned him back to the herd. And it was fascinating from the footage that you got, David, that within seven minutes of him being back into the herd, he'd taken himself around the side of the hill and, and basically joined in and, and was fighting with uh, another stag. We'll see when stags also show aggression, they tilt their head back and, and you can see in that bit of footage you've got, it's rather excellent, you can see the stags are walking back and forward toward one another with aggression. The other thing you'll hear them doing is they start to grind their teeth and very often when you're feeding deer it's an idea to keep an eye on park stags, so you hear them grinding their teeth and a little bit of the steady eye thing going on then, then you know it's, it's a sign of aggression. What was fascinating with the camera on the stag though is you could actually not only see the, the interaction of him tilting his head back, but you can actually hear him grinding his teeth when he approached the other guy. So it was full on aggression, it's classic a aggression behaviour of a red deer. Hinds will do it as well too actually, if, you, if you've got hinds in about you and they're a wee bit aggressive, you'll get the hinds grinding their teeth as well. What was also interesting was to see uh, from his perspective how he sees other big stags and you've got a bit there where you can see him giving a big stag a wide berth but what we knew behaviourally what you then see him doing is quite happily and confidently approaching a stag that he felt bigger than and then you've got a bit of jostling and conflict and where he tried to uh, assert himself and take over that group and appears lost at one point he's thrown a stag down the bank and then something's happened and uh, when we catch up with him again later he's gone and laid up for a while and then before we run out of uh, time on the camera, we can actually see him going back to the same spot, obviously intent on having another go again. 
And also for me, interesting things to look at uh, from his nostril movement, his respiratory rate, and also the, the number of times he went and had a drink. As well as drinking, a half-hearted roar and some thrashing around, there was a lot of resting up. But with camera intact and deer intact, it was a success and something Neil is happy to refine and try again. This is an incredible spectacle. This is one of the few places left now in Western Europe where you can go and see large free-living wild mammals behaving in, in, in a natural way with all the social interaction that goes on. Yes, let's do it again. Let's celebrate this incredible spectacle that goes on in the Highland Hills every year. Fabulous insights into the titans of the hill, as Neil calls them. And thank you to David Ainsworth for his expertise. If you'd like to see more from this stag, you can search on the internet for hashtag stagcam or follow the links in the description below. Now from a stag with a swagger to someone who really would fit Neil's triangle, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Chris Packham has saved a dangerous seagull for the nation. Looking for food, the girl dive-bombed tourists, including this wedding party, on the island of Jersey. The council wanted to shoot it, but Packham lobbied them not to. Now the council says that moving the girl somewhere else will solve the problem. Antis are trying to ban grouse shooting in the UK. Shooters are trying to ban any ban. To sign the latest petition, go to bit.ly forward slash protect grouse 2. As huge crowds gathered at traditional Boxing Day hunt meets across the UK, at one hunt, saboteurs accidentally drove a fox towards the hounds. Black masked thugs were trying to disrupt the Great Thurlow hunt in the east of England, which was legally trail hunting. Then a fox got up. Huntsmen successfully called off the hounds, but the saboteurs' reaction sent the fox straight back to the hounds, which killed it. The saboteurs reported the incident to the police. A Gulf falconry festival has gone back to catching hubara bustards. The Qatar International Falcons and Hunting Festival used live hubaras in its first year, then because of conservation concerns, used electronic hubaras alongside live doves. Qatar's success in breeding the rare bustard means that for its ninth year, the festival is now able to use live bustards once again. The festival continues until the 27th of January 2018. For more, go to alganas.net. And finally, watch thieves steal 31 guns in 60 seconds. CCTV records the thieves at work at the Double Tap Tactical Gun Shop in Clarksville, Northern Tennessee, USA. Police response time was six minutes, so they didn't catch the thieves and are now offering a $5,000 reward for information leading to their capture. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now we're not far from the British shooting show. Let's have a look at what's on offer. <laughs> Next up, Grandad is taking the heat and breaking the tradition. He's going orange. It's the beating line. We finish where our three generations of beatings started, with Grandfather Peter. He has been trailblazing the blaze orange Zealand Herculean suit, built for the tough stuff. He's been wearing it all season, and shoot boss Paul Childerly thinks we should gauge public opinion by asking the full beating team what they think. Right, team. Do you feel, honestly, that it's a benefit, or I know some of you don't want to be seen because you get told off, 
you can be seen. Do you think it's a, it's a benefit or a, or a negative? Negative, we've got a negative here. Let's have a, let's have a vote. So everyone thinks it's negative, put your hand up. Definitely. Miserable, miserable. <laughs> I'm positive. As they argue it out among themselves, let's hear more from Peter and when he first joined the beating line. When I moved to Woburn about 40 odd years ago, when I first came to work in Woburn before I moved, and then after about three years I moved to the village and, and, and I started then really on a shoot on, on Bedford Estates um, and went on to do it for years and then Richard followed on for me and Jack's followed on for him really. What do you think about it? Yeah it's nice to see it's nice to see Jack t taking it up especially the shooting side of it because I was never that, that brilliant a shot but Richard was I mean he was he shot for Bedfordshire and Jack's following in his footsteps now so it's good yeah. What about less so we just got a, a triangle on the back two triangles and nothing else. Yeah. You can't get anything sensible out of you lot, can you? Why do you do it? I don't know, because I like being out in the countryside and I like the field sports. It's just, you know, one of those things you do when you're in the country. People don't appreciate what it's all about, though. that's the trouble. But then you've got your grandson who totally appreciates what it's all about. Yeah, he does, yeah. Yeah, because he's been brought up with it and he enjoys it, but yeah. I mean, until you've done it, I don't think you appreciate what it's all about, to be truthful. Is it helpful on a grouse moor on a partridge day? Not in a woodland when we're all shooting up in the air, but when they're, when they're shooting low grace coming towards you and, and you've got a flash of beetle. Do you think the guns appreciate how much work goes in behind the scenes? Some do, some don't. You do get some of the, some of the guns come and thank you afterwards and say what a lovely day it's been and thank you very much and others just don't bother, no. But there again, you just do it for the enjoyment really. You certainly don't do it for the money. <laughs> That seems to be a recurring theme. <laughs> you don't need it to be safe, but it's just another reassurance that we're thinking about safety and health and safety, basically. Um, so with that in mind, I think a little bit is good. Not full, full blown orange, but like I say, having a tab on or, or, a, or a certain part of your clothing, a little bit orange. And I don't think it looks so good with some tweed and, a, and these pads here blaze orange, but I'm sure there's some tasteful ways that we could, you know, they could come up with it and make it like, you know, suitable for, for the game shooting field. We put you in what is obviously quite a controversial outfit. Tell me some of the abuse that you received for this. Um, was I going to work on the motorway? Uh, don't go too far over on that drive by the motorway because I think you're in the, the, in the cone gang. <laughs> some people say it's good, yeah, because you can see you in the line and, the, you know, they can pivot on you. They can see you and pivot everybody around you, yeah. Yeah, some, it, there's, there's, there's fours and against really, but there you go, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so, after putting it to the public vote, what do the people say? If, I, if you all get a free coat like this, would you wear them? Yes. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry for the abuse you receive, Peter. Now from the highways and railways of Britain to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. The big film of the week is the latest barrage from the Countryside Alliance in the ongoing battle about fox hunting in Scotland. It's by the talented Byron and Daryl Pace, and of course gives the arguments in favour of hunting. Dewey Cash gets in touch. He blogs about deer hunting in the USA. Not much action, but lots of chat. Here he gets one in Tennessee. The superb Igor Timmermans and Annette Martins from Dutch hunting magazine Weidmansheil went to the Altai Mountains of Mongolia last year. Incredibly tough conditions for hunting ibex but a good shot. Peregrine falcon versus teal duck will not be to everyone's taste but this is how Moroccans train their peregrines with a duck in a box. Pakistanis are breeding dogs to bring down wild boar. Here is a shikar in the Punjab from the Just Hunters channel. More on boar from another French Moroccan, Badra Al Azri. This is an extraordinary shot. He'd have been pretty cross if he missed it. Back to the United States and night vision company ATN wants to show off its Obsidian app where you can view live streaming on your phone. In this film they do for 17 pigs with an ATN X Site 2. 
And finally, Illinois Trapper Outdoors amalgamates his 2017 duck season into one video. Not many duck, but if you follow his channel you can see he is a busy boy. There's lots of chat and even footage of him picking up a takeaway. It's how they do it in Illinois. That's it for this week. I have put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top 8, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well that's it for this week. If you have not done so already please pop over to our website fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook, you can follow us on Twitter, you can subscribe to us on YouTube and you can even pop your email into our register form on our register page and we'll contact you about this show. It's Field Sports Britain, it's at 7pm UK time every Wednesday and this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye.